Look, mom, I know what it looks like, but I promise you, this is pure art. The Case Study of Vanitas is an anime that I initially dismissed as one of those wonderfully animated series suffering from the typical manga fanboy fangirl hype. Vampires and the people that fight them have never really been a subject that I've been interested in. And that's not just because I grew up in a time where making hating on Twilight your personality was basically a requirement to garner any respect in the middle school lunchroom. To me, they are just another word for demons, which is just another word for this writer has little to no creativity. The first episode didn't seem bad, but the volumes of terminology and the vagueness of the plot at large convinced me to throw it into the bin of, I'm not going to watch it, but I'm going to recommend it so its followers don't get mad at me. And I thought that was that. And then, on a whim, I actually looked into it. The manga is written and illustrated by Jun Mochizuki, who made a name for herself with the 2006 smash hit Pandora Hearts. Personally, I never read this manga, hell, I don't even think I've heard of it except in occasional passing, because honestly I thought it was just a romance. But as the wonderful Mao reviewer put it, don't let the Tumblr shippers and fangirls fool you, there barely is something that can be called a romance in it. Speaking of Mao reviewers, this manga received straight 10 out of 10 scores on all of its top reviews, a feat that some of even the great greatest manga can't achieve, as there is always a wonderful contrarian trying to tell you that Fullmetal Alchemist is actually a 3 out of 10. The case study of Vanitas takes place in alternative steampunk Paris in the aftermath of a war between humans and vampires, resulting from a mad scientist attempting to rewrite reality. Surprisingly, we follow a vampire named Noé, and that's the pronunciation I'm going with because that's how Google Translate says it's pronounced in French, in search of an artifact known as the Book of Vanitas, a vampire of the blue moon that most vampires are taught to fear. In his search, he runs into a human who takes the namesake of Vanitas and is also in possession of the book. These two begin a quest to find the source of a growing corruption of vampires, an enigmatic being known as the Parade of Charlatan. So how about we start with the obvious, the animation. To use the most academic and formal terms possible to describe the animation of this series, studio bones don't miss. Animation director Yoshiyoki Ito ought to have no introduction, but just in case, you may know him from his key animation on Summer Wars and Cowboy Bebop, to his animation direction on Concrete Revolution and Space Dandy. But as is any good Studio Bones production, we have an army of key animators treating each and every scene like a flex. Toshiharu Suge made me back up again and again to watch Noe go full Simone Biles and launch himself at Vinitas. Yume Ukai animates this introduction to the Book of Vinitas in a brilliant hand-drawn piece that I can only imagine took weeks on its own. Naoki Kono brings the fear and monstrousness of the first cursed vampire to life. Even this simple scene of Vinitas Vanitas descending down looks like it could cost more than my car. And of course, the most important part of the anime is... Um, of course though, the most important part of the anime are the battle scenes that feature the effects heavy, debris ridden goodness of a Bones fight that you've come to expect. There really, really isn't anything like a good Studio Bones production, bringing together some of anime's greatest talents to bring Mochizuki's action to life. That being said, the real magic, the real Gordon Ramsay special lamb sauce of the case study of Vinitas is not the action, it's the, well, actually it's the action. But the tasty potatoes on the side that are equally important are the scenes between action. It's often said that absent fight scenes, anime is just colored manga panels with equally as much movement. Director Yomiyuki Itomura, best known for his work on the Monogatari anime, overcomes this anime pitfall and his unique style is disturbingly obvious. The quick cuts, the zoom-ins, and the facial framings have obvious blood relations in Monogatari. However, I've noted before that this sort of avant-garde approach toward editing can be off-putting if not confusing for the casual viewer. Vanitas overcomes this with a wonderfully smooth transition between its humorous or otherwise bizarre moments into the more serious, more action and plot-oriented scenes. And of course, we can't forget about the anime's incredible composition, which perfectly encapsulates the Victorian steampunk atmosphere of the anime's setting. Considering the already star-studded staff that can only be conjured by a ritual to be above himself, it's no surprise at this point that they also managed to somehow get Yuki Kaijura on this project. She is, of course, responsible for the musical score of everything from Pandora Hearts, Madoka Magica, Fate Zero, and the entire Japanese box office for the past four years. In my opinion, she is the undisputed queen of the modern anime soundtrack, and knows exactly how to draw you into the world she seeks to craft. With such a heavy emphasis on Victorian violin, one has to wonder if the devil has gone down to Georgia with how many unique orchestral tunes punctuate the 23-minute visual spectacle of Vanitas. And yeah, of course, I know it's considered bad form to 
attribute the catchiness of an opening to the quality of an anime, but goddamn is Soda no Itsuru by Sauce Anomaly so fun to listen to, even if the happy-go-lucky atmosphere isn't really the best fit to much of the grim darkness of this show. But speaking of grim darkness, let's talk about the series itself, because you need more than just pretty colors to make an anime. Especially with Shonen, you need to build a compelling world that will stop you from being cancelled in just one volume. Even in the best of Shonen, your Naruto's, your One Piece's, the world is given to you from the very start. While there are various mysteries hidden throughout the universe of My Hero Academia, we still know from the very start that we live in a world of quirks, that there's a bunch of hero agencies keeping the peace, and that there's a really cool buff guy running around named All Might. The case study of Veninus does things very, very different. In the first 10 minutes or so of the anime, the audience is aware of basically nothing. In fact, I made a point in my summer anime video that during the first episode, I was pretty much as lost as a high schooler doing their first read-through of Dune. As the first episode concludes, the audience is led to believe that vampires are simply a naturally occurring phenomenon in this world, only for episode 3 to casually reveal an entirely separate dimension where they reside as if we just kind of knew that the whole time. Alright then, then this universe is one with two dimensions, a vampire dimension and a human dimension then. A little more interesting, but nothing to get your panties in a twist over. That is, until something called the Babel Incident is hinted at and later revealed to be a mishap by a mad scientist who twisted the formulas of reality itself. Even our good friend Vanitas doesn't lay all of his cards on the table, waiting until the fourth episode to flex his mark of possession. A little important detail which denotes how vampires actually end up controlling humans. In case you couldn't see the pattern here, Mochizuki prefers to drip feed you the world of Vanitas, rather than establish it from the beginning. I'll be the first to admit that I really wasn't on board with this. I usually like to know what the hell is going on when I'm watching something when I start watching it. But the strategy of withholding world building from the audience means that we are continuously anticipating new reveals, feeling as if there's always more to come. Vanitas is not just feeding you plot developments, but a promise of the full picture. We don't merely hope for this character to fight that character, or wonder if this villain will turn good or this hero will turn bad. Instead, we constantly question our underlying assumptions as to how the world works at all. I'm told, so far, that an alchemist figured out how to rewrite reality itself, resulting in the creation of vampires in further chaos. But is that really what is going on? After all, this anime is always apt to remind you, you've been wrong before. Now, all that being said, no amount of highbrow, big-brained, graduate school-educated writing theory can overcome a story that's boring as fuck. Luckily, as you might garner by the not-so-subtle title of this video, the case study of Vanitas is not that. The concept of the Parade of Charlatan reminds me very much of D. Grayman's Millennium Earl. There's something quite captivating about an unknown, indescribable entity slowly leading the world toward ruin, rather than a very well-defined enemy we learn about from the very beginning. I'll admit, I'm the first to be quite partial to surrealism and mind screws, and based on the Pandora Heart reviews, it would seem Jun Mochizuki's would have a propensity toward these types of narratives, to say the least. In my mind's eye, I can already see such a situation brewing with the idea of the Babel Incident, and a separate dimension built on formulas that can be rewritten to turn humans into blood-sucking parasites as if we weren't already. Learning to write compelling universes from scratch is not easy. Luckily, this video's sponsor Skillshare has a fantastic creative writing class from Daniel Jose Older. He's the author of Star Wars High Republic Adventures, one of the first stories in the franchise attempting to canonize an era before the prequel films. I was skeptical of this project as an Old Republic fan, but after reading this book, I have full confidence in the project. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and get lost in creativity. It's curated specifically for learning, meaning there are no ads, and they're always launching new premium classes so you can stay focused and follow wherever your creativity takes you. The first 1,000 of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare so that you can start exploring your creativity today. So moving past the very versatile vision of Vanitas' world, Mojizuki used the same skilled writing design that she used to create the world to create the characters of Noe and Vanitas themselves. The relationship between our duo is brilliant and a little borderline queer-coded, but their individual stories are even more compelling. Like the setting of the anime itself, we are introduced to Noe as a completely blank slate, only to learn that he's a vampire later in the episode. Then in episode 2, we learn his power is to dive into your mind Inception style, and finally, learn about his tragic shonen backstory in episode 5. His motivation for defeating his overwhelming guilt isn't thrust upon you from the beginning, giving you time to grow with the character so the eventual reveal is all the more meaningful to you. Similarly, Vanitas is a complete mystery, giving little to no explanation through anything but the occasional interaction 
interaction between him and Noe. Using this sexual ten I mean character tension, to build up a picture of this mysterious human unsurprisingly made me all the more interested in finding out who he was as a person, and not just what powers he has or who he fights. A common frustration I hold with most shonen. And, of course, this leads us to the biggest mystery of characterization of these two. The detective is already dead. Er, I mean, the doctor is already dead. At the very end of the first episode, Noe makes a surprise announcement that he ended up killing Vanitas with his own two hands. The idea of spoiling the ending of a series is not a new one within anime. The very first scene of Gurren Lagann featured Simone standing on a space battleship overlooking a dimensional wormhole. But this doesn't ruin the anime, however, quite the opposite. As the series runs and our character develops, the lingering question in the back of our minds will always and forever be, how did this cuddly little cupcake manage to give his best friend the smoke? This sort of narrative strategy can't work in every series. If Oda started Volume 1 of One Piece with Luffy standing up with the titular treasure, it would sort of depress the power of the adventure, like watching a YouTube video that basically spoils the entire manga. But for a series like Vanitas, where the audience is slowly coming to learn who exactly these two people are, the thorn in the back of your mind reminding you it all goes wrong is a powerful motivator. Every new scene that creates a more complex view of their growing relationship at the same time is a small step closer to their demise. Taking all of this into account reveals exactly what makes the case study of Benitas so compelling. The characters themselves are inseparable from the world building at large. Unlike traditional shonen, Noe and Vanitas are not nearly inhabitants of this anime's universe, but the universe themselves. This observation, in essence, is what blew me away as I watched the case study in Vanitas and continued to do so as I read the manga. Early on, it's revealed that Noe is an orphan that was actually found in the human world, passed around from vampire slave owner to vampire slave owner. Eventually, he finds himself under the tutelage of a man he calls Teacher, and makes friends with a fellow vampire named Louise, who ends up killing everyone Noe has ever loved, begging for his own death. Surrounded by bodies, Noe looks up at the teacher and sees the face of the series' antagonist, the Parade of Charlatan. The question of whether Noe was being groomed by Charlatan or why he took him in becomes a central mystery to the series, and directly ties the truth of the anime's world with the truth about the anime's protagonist. And this is the genius of the case study of Vanitas. There is no demarcation between worldbuilding and characters, they are one and the same. We the audience don't have the luxury of ignoring these characters' growth, because they're growth is the answer we're searching for. The case study of Vanitas is undoubtedly one of the most hyped anime of this season, but will still likely not make much of a blip in the mainstream, and truly that's a shame. I was unlucky enough to miss out with Pandora Hearts, and I have no intention of doing the same with this anime. Sometimes, it's important to remind yourself that hype is often warranted. Thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see y'all next time. Peace.